Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, so in today's demo round, uh, and just a reminder, could you please mute your microphones? Um, we're going to be actually doing the release demo for the 0 0.13 uh, release that was done five days ago now. Um, so we're going to go through what was included in the release uh, for thinedge.io, um, the major features, uh, because it's a massive step in the direction for our 1.0 release, which is planned for end of the year. So as like anything that we do in the project, uh, we have the project um, publicly visible from GitHub and also all of our release notes are available here. So just a reminder if you don't know where that is, uh, so the thinedge.io page, or if you're on the documentation, which is really easy to remember, thinedge.io, you can go to the GitHub and then check out the releases, and you can then see what the, the most recent release notes are uh, to go into more detail what is then included in them. So I'm going to be using the agenda there as the touch point, and then I'm going to be demonstrating some of those features then live. But some features we've demonstrated before, um, so I won't go through every kind of minutiae detail, but we'll definitely highlight the most important points. So with the kickoff of the 0 0.13, one of the major um, shifts that we've also previously presented is the supporting for any Linux distribution. So when I say any Linux distribution, I mean like, you know, Debian or obviously Debian Ubuntu, uh, Alpine Linux, you know, any of the Red Hat um, uh, variants, so Fedora, et cetera. Um, we also support that. So um, it makes it easier to consume and everything's also auto detected through the new install script. So it should be a lot more consumable. Um, and so we've made that possible by using more uh, Linux package formats. Um, so we have, you know, Debian, APK, RPM. And if everything else fails and using a very exotic distribution, uh, we fall back to just using the tables. Uh, so then you can then use the thin edge how you want. If you want to start it or run it under your own kind of service managers, then you can do that. So as a kind of pairing to that feature, uh, so by default, we support system D as a init system. So like a service manager per se. Um, we also have opened up to, through the community support, um, support for additional init systems. So we actually have six additional ones or five additional ones um, that we can then, you can install optionally because most cases you don't need that. However, we've also created a new install script to detect which services or service manager you're using if you opt in for this behavior. Um, to make it also easier for you if you don't really know what a init system is, then we can help you make that decision for you. So let's just check out the docs there so everyone's aware. So you may see that we have dramatically simplified the install kind of guide as well. So it's really just a one liner that we also provide curl or wget that you can really just install thin edge very, very easily. It does all of the sudo magic if it needs to or doesn't need to, so it doesn't depend on sudo anymore. Um, so if you don't have sudo installed like in Docker environment, you're all good. Um, so everything is very seamless now. Um, and the same with kind of the package, uh, so with the uh, other systems not using system D, uh, similar thing that you can install kind of the optional non-system D services uh, by an install script. But like anything, we're really looking for people. So if you're a power user and going, I don't like using these one liner install scripts because that does too much magic for you, then that's okay because all of the packages that we use then within these install scripts are actually also available via APT, RPM. So you see the pattern here. We're using the same kind of uh, utilities. The install scripts are just basically a wrapper for if you maybe don't have the technical knowledge about the stuff, uh, that it kind of just does everything for you. So more convenient scripts. But you can definitely go and check out our CloudSmith repository to install any of the packages that we use within the scripts. So with that, that should see a dramatic kind of um, increase in acceptance and being able to install things on you know random devices and not saying, oh, we don't have a Debian device. 
Um, so it should make it a little bit more accessible for everyone. Um, and not only for actual you know, devices, also if you're using it in any kind of um, container builds, uh, so that dramatically simplifies the process. And I'll show that um, when we get into the demo part uh, shortly. So if you have any feedback also from that, um, how we can improve it even further, or if there's corner cases that didn't do uh, proper detection, please just raise a ticket and we can address it um, as quick as possible. So going back to the release notes. So now we've talking, spoken about how to make Thin Edge more accessible. Um, so that is also very important to version one, but something that's probably more important after you've installed Thin Edge is the 0 0.13 release marks the change to using the new TE slash topics on the MQTT broker. So this is part of our new public API that will be supported in V1 onwards, and we're committing to this API. So we've done previous presentations where we presented the concepts behind it. Um, so now we've done all of the implementation um, where it has a lot of uh, a lot of benefits. So it's not just porting the existing functionality. It's also extending it to uh, support updating um, digital twin information uh, for commonality lawyer, uh, commonality people um, that's updating custom manage object fragments. Um, so you can do that by the MQT interface now. You can register devices. You can register child devices. You can register nested child devices. You can publish measurements, all telemetry to services, child devices, nested child devices, and it's all using a very easy, consistent API. So let's have a quick refresher. Um, so again, going to the documentation just so everyone's aware how do i consume this information and also maybe a few kind of useful links if i'm familiar with the old tedge forward slash topics how does that look in the te forward slash topics um so the te forward slash topics i would really recommend everyone read this page uh, because understanding it and you can kind of makes it easy to reason with um because because of the consistency aspect there you can kind of guess a lot of the things now. So if you know how to publish an event, you know how to publish an alarm because it just changes one character. Um, so I would really encourage people to read this because it breaks it down into, let's make that a bit bigger, um, that we have the root prefix, which is the new TE. Then we have a four part identifier, which says, where is my destination where this data should be related to? So whether it's a child device, the main device, a service of the child device, a service of the main device, some nested things or whatever. It's a unique identifier for that kind of entity. Then everything after that is like the channel information. So whether it's a telemetry, whether it's a command, um, et cetera, all of that is detailed there. And we also support types for everything. So everything is also clearly um, kind of described. So you can also make it easier to subscribe to particular data and whatever, uh, and uh, so you can utilize all of like adding custom types for measurements, which we previously didn't support uh, in Commodity that is now supported. Um, and it just makes for a very, very consistent API. So I'll go through publishing a bit of data uh, in the live demo, but just for on this page. So if you're on the start, you can also navigate and go, so let me just change this. MQTT API. So I can quickly get to the API. And you can also look at the backwards compatibility. So at the moment, because using a new topic is jarring. So we admit that. So that's why uh, we have an automatic translator. So Thin Edge does translate from the TEDGE topics to the TE topics. So everything should still just work. Um, with a few minor exceptions for the health status of services. Um, however, I would really encourage everyone to start transitioning to the new TE topics because you, you can then start using the benefits of them and it's much more consistent. And so it's no more, where do I put the child device? Is it at the beginning or the prefix or all this kind of stuff? It makes it a lot easier to work with. And it should be 
relatively painless to translate to that. It's more or less just a global search and replace. Um, so a lot of the instances, it should be quite easy. So, but just to make that transition easier, uh, in addition to going, how do I make the code changes in my code base? Um, you can look at the translation tables that we've written that says, if you were previously publishing to this, that now looks like this with the optional type. And if you don't provide the type, we use the previous default of thin edge measurement. Um, but obviously everyone likes using the type, so I would encourage you to use the type, um, but it's a simple translation replacing that with this string and then you're good. So same thing for events, alarms and health status. And then we've also written for child devices. Um, so that instead of like tacking it on at the end, that we have it there instead of the main device that you publish, uh, it's always in the second field, which is the child device ID. So if there is any information which, or like uh, traps you always fall into when you're doing the translation, uh, please also let us know because we can add it as a, a tips and tricks kind of as part of this section, just to say, hey, watch out for this because other users have experienced this, um, just so it's a little bit smoother transition. So we're always open to feedback to making the documentation more uh, useful uh, for everyone. Okay, let's go back to... Okay, I think that's enough uh, dry going through the release notes and let's have a look at a demo. So to demo this, I am going to spin up a new um, container, but actually using something that um, a container using lightweight services. Uh, so not system D, so it's using an Alpine image. Uh, so let me just show you what I'm doing. So as part of the Tej demo project, so which is now linked, uh, thanks to Nico uh, for adding that in, um, which is a easy to try out um, set up of ThinEdge that you can start ThinEdge in a container and then play around with all the features that it provides. Uh, so we've also extended this example to do more of a, sorry, one sec, um, single process kind of setup. We're not fully ready there um, for public consumption, uh, but this is just kind of what we're using at the moment uh, because it highlights a few things that I want to highlight. Um, so I'm just going to start it. And then we'll see what it looks like in. So I'm going to use in this instance, Comlocity UI uh, to kind of demonstrate a lot of the device management functionality. Um, so what I have here is, so for my container setup, so I have a main device and a child device, but because I want to do it more Docker conform or container conform, I'm trying to limit what runs in each container. So I actually have multiple containers to, to create this kind of setup. So I have a Mosquito container. So the Mosquito is running separately, so I can maintain that individually. Cool. Uh, then I have a Mapper container, which is only tasked with mapping Comlocity messages or talking with Comlocity um, and you know translating those messages to the thin edge interface. And then I actually have two containers, which one is for the main device to do main device uh, device management and one for the child device. And I'll go into what makes that cool uh, very shortly. So now that it's spun up, if I go to the UI in Comlocity and I'm just going to look for release demo. So we can see here while it's talking, uh, this is a new device that I, I deleted before and created again just now. Um, so we can see that we're running 0 0.13 gold. So I know that I am running the latest and greatest. I can check out what's running on the main device. Uh, so I can see all of my Tej services um, are up and running, which are all good. Um, and then I can kind of interact with it as normal. So, you know, request configuration, set configuration, you know, get log entries and whatever. Let's, you can also do software management. Um, but let's just to prove that to go on the line, it can be installed on any OS or any Linux distribution. So if I just look at the release file, so we can see here it's Alpine Linux 
So it's not Debian, which we've previously only pretty much shown that it's all Debian systems. So this is Alpine. It has nothing to do with system D. So it's actually using something called S6 overlay, which is a lightweight service manager, which is container friendly. Um, so we can see it kind of worked out of the, or not out of the box, but with the two install scripts that I mentioned earlier, and then everything's up and running. So with that, we also have like, for example, um, to use the, the strong kind of software management plugin system. Uh, so there's a community plugin to install APK packages. So if we just look for, I know, install HTOP with APK, it gets processed. So everything kind of behaves and we're in a totally new world and not a Debian world. So all of that kind of works um, nicely and there's a lot of improvements there. Um, so part of that setup, those that know the services quite well and was have keen eyes, um, you may notice in the services that we've had new service names for some of the components. So that was also included in 0 0.13. We've switched to the more generic Tej configuration plugin and Tej log plugin instead of C8Y um, equivalents, because these components are now generic and do not have any logic to relate to Comolosity. So this means that you can actually use these same components for other clouds which is a great step forward, and it also makes the encapsulation of the code a little bit easier. Um, but in addition, because we've removed all the Comolosity logic from those plugins directly, we've opened up then a command interface that you can also use locally via MQT messages to also trigger the same actions. Um, so we're going to document kind of what the public APIs are for that, but that will be part of the public API. So that means whether it makes it easier to write your own cloud mappers, or if you have a local, you don't have a mapper, a cloud mapper, you have some kind of local service that you want to um, open the Tej API locally that have maybe a local reconciler or something that can then automatically install packages um, when it sees a diff in something or whatever. Um, it makes that process a lot easier because triggering the process of either installing software or fetching logs, setting configuration, updating, config, uh, getting configuration can be done also locally. Um, so that was also previously something not possible. In addition, so this is where it kind of gets really cool. So you may notice that I have a child device and I mentioned it before, but let's let's have a look what's happening here. So I have a child device now. It is a thinedge.io child. Okay, cool. What does that mean? Let's have a look at services. So for a child device, we now have a subset of services. So the Tedge agent, log and configuration plugin running as a child device, communicating to the same broker, but then it's, uh, it's not communicating anything with Comolosity directly. The mapper is then handling all of the um, the communication from the cloud and then using the local Tedge interface then to communicate with the chart device. So we've actually created that our components are reusable. So you can also deploy them on chart devices. So for instance, as we previously had an example Python script that would show how you could run a device connector. Um, but we realized that all of the implementation on that child device was actually just re-implementing things we did already did in Rust. So we're like, well, why can't we just reuse the same components? If if you're happy with the features that we deliver on the main device, you can just have the same features on the child devices. Um, and it doesn't use it do, because it doesn't communicate directly with Comolosity. That means you don't have another certificate to manage or anything like that. And you don't need to bootstrap it. You just register it locally and then you're good. So Let's show off some of the features. So this behaves exactly like the main device from a user's perspective. Uh, so we can see here the software. I've, I've got a software list. So I can also install software. So HTOP as well. Cool. 
cool. It's installed, so it should be in the list. HTOP is now on the list. Um, we can get log entries from that. So you, you get a very immersive experience, which is exactly like the main device. So it's very feature rich, everything out of the box. So if you were doing a custom device agent, which was doing this kind of functionality anyway, then the idea is to remove the need to write a device management, uh, sorry, your own device connector in that instance. Um, as long as the, um, like you're happy with the features, but because we're really pushing this flexibility of, um, you know, making the features so extensible that we deliver, you know, 90% of what users need, then it really goes into configuration. You don't need to write any code, which means less maintenance costs and, you know, keeping a development team that has the knowledge of what was developed is also difficult. Um, so that is virtually eliminated or reduced significantly. Um, so all of the features work there. So they get configuration, set configuration and everything like that. So this is part of a common pattern that we're going into to make all of these components more um, reusable. And it's it started off with our actor refactoring like a few months ago and then the generic um, making all the plugins generic. Uh, to really make this experience super, super easy. So let's use this kind of setup, and I just kind of want to show another feature off. Um, so let me just get something set up. So what I want to highlight next is a combination of the new MQTT API and some of the added benefits that you get from it because of this consistency it's easy to consume it's easy to subscribe for local events and then do something from those like local, uh, local events um, and in addition so we have a new feature which i'll just show briefly called the comelocity api proxy so the local comelocity iot api proxy so we have another service running on the mapper, which is then providing a local endpoint that you can then, if you need to do Comlossy API interaction, so let's say upload a event binary, you can actually interface with the Comlossy API directly, uh, and you don't actually need to worry about your authentication because this service is smart enough to say, OK, I'm going to uh, do the authentication for you so you don't need to request any tokens anymore. Um, so that happens out of the, the box there. The follow up activity is we want to then introduce certificate based authentication for said endpoints. Uh, so that's also on the roadmap from V1. Um, so but at least this kind of simplifies the extension of plugins. So what so I did this demo this morning about an hour ago, and it took me about 30 minutes to do. Um, so again, trying to highlight the ease of development that we're also trying to achieve with Edge. So what do I want to run? One thing which I personally find a little bit annoying, um, which it will be on a future uh, feature for sure, um, but at the moment, uh, so let's say I'm using the software management plugin to install a plugin. Uh, sorry, install a package. So I'm just going to choose an invalid package. Whoops, if I can spell. So this package, like the name suggests, it's invalid, so it doesn't exist. It's just a, a package name I made up. So the classic way when you're developing, especially if you're doing a custom software management plugin, I think one of the pet peeves is you try to install something. You go, uh, OK. Ah, OK, failed. Hmm. You go, OK, log error. So you have a few different options. So the standard option would be, you know, you go to the logs and go request. OK, look at that. And you go, ah, OK, it's uh, here. No such package. It, which is still in itself useful, um, but what would be more useful would be automatically upload the log file on errors. So I can basically save this log file request thing. So 
This could also happen in an automated sense. So the device could just be, you know, taking along. Then, you know, if you have a thousand devices, imagine doing that log file request on a thousand devices. That's just not very easy to do. Um, so just to demonstrate this, how easy it was to kind of add something which provide this functionality. So I'm just going to get set up and get to screen so you can kind of see what's happening. So on the left side, so this is both showing the child device. I'm just going to subscribe to the events on the right side. And on the left side, I am just going to do the same software installation. Before I, I'll just get set up, but before I actually click go, so I need to do apply changes before it actually sends it. Um, so I'm just going to, in my demo, there we go. Because I haven't made it as a service, um, I'm just going to start as a script. So what I, have I done here? So let me just close those. So I have something called a command watcher, which is pretty simple scripts. All it does is subscribe to a topic. Does a bit of a grep to say, hey, do I see this C device log file, a particular error message in the um, commands. So in specifically, it's looking for software update commands. You could actually do this for every, any command, as long as it follows that same pattern. Um, that would also work. And I read that, and then I just do a bit of parsing of that message to pick out the file, check if that file exists, and then I upload it. So what's that upload doing? Slightly few more steps, but still nothing too crazy. Um, here it's using the Comolosity authentication client. Uh, sorry, proxy. So all it needs to do is so it communicates this to a local kind of endpoint, which is on port 8001, also configurable. Um, so first, if you know Comolosity uh, REST API, that you need to get the manage object ID, create an event for that, and then attach the binary to the event just so it gets cleaned up properly and it gets um, enacted by the data retention rules and convolocity and stuff. So it needs a little bit of convolocity knowledge there, but you can easily go to the REST API and see any of these requests. So all this, so I'm, what I'm going to do is on the device, and I'm on the trial device, I'm just going to start the command watcher. So this will be running in the background now. Let me just get that up. So now when I request it, and if everything goes right, when it goes failed, you'll see how I got an automatic event coming up here. And because that sign says it has a binary behind it, I have it and then I can view it directly. So I didn't need to request anything. Um, it all just kind of happened uh, automatically for me. So what does that really highlight? So I think we can guarantee this will definitely be a feature of Thin Edge in the future. Um, however, what I think is a good validation on our API design and the features like of the uh, Comolosity authentication proxy is how useful are these tools to do something unexpected? So this was a new use case. They're going, well, can I implement this on my own? Yes, took me half an hour. Um, so because and as you can see, it's also just two simple scripts, so it's nothing too crazy. Um, this would actually work on a child device or a main device, or because it would have to run, you know, where you have access to the file system. Um, but it's quite easy to run, and you can, it's easy to make this script versatile, so you can run in different roles on the main or child devices. And with the command watcher, so this really goes on, plays on our consistency and observability of our new MQT API on the device, because we have the concept of you can read whatever kind of root prefix is used by ThinEdge from the Tedge config, read in the topic ID to say, what topic am I listening to? And that is representing me. And then we have, I want to subscribe to commands. What kind of command? Software update. 
And then the last part is to get any command ID. So each command will have a unique ID, uh, which is the last part of the topic. And so we don't really care what the ID is. We're just looking for particular messages um, that you know have a failure reason with matching this kind of pattern. And then that's it. So and because this is then part of our stable API, we can use that in the future. And you can be sure that um, you know you don't need to change your implementation every month or something because uh, we do breaking changes. This is API we're committing to. And it's very consistent. Um, so I think it was a, a good kind of proof of our design um, that there's a lot of kind of easy to use um, elements that come with it for free, which is great. So let's go back to, ah, uh, yeah. So we'll still, let's still use the demo and show off another kind of great feature um, of the API that we previously didn't have possible. But here I'm also going to use um, the documentation because we're also a firm believer that you know our docs should be good. And I hope everyone's appreciated the improvements that we've done this year on them. Um, so what I want to also look at the, I don't know, the, let's go to the MQC API. It explains a little bit about the, the setup. However, maybe I want to do something a little bit more complicated. So with this topic structure, we have an assumed kind of topic schema or a scheme, as we call it, where the identifier where this is kind of the default, where we have the device, which is a fixed string, and then the device ID, let me make that bigger, uh, device ID, service, again, fixed string, and then the service ID. So if it's not a service, it's just empty, et cetera, again, described in the documentation. Um, so this is kind of like the default case. And that's all the cases that works with um, auto registration. So if you don't want to do registration messages or whatever, because you, you have no need. OK, fair enough. Um, but if you want to get more complicated use cases where you might have, let's say, a local component that you need to leverage the MQT topic structure to, to be able to subscribe to a subset of devices, and we might be talking, you know, a thousand different devices locally on the um, on the gateway. Um, so you need some kind of way of subscribing to multiple things and group them under some kind of hierarchy. So we actually support advanced topic structures now. So it's mentioned in the advanced section. We're looking to also have more use cases, but that's planned uh, to frame an IoT problem and then describe how that's done. Um, so I'll gloss over some of the, the more specifics. Um, but this page explains going well. We were just trying to keep it simple for everyone at the start, but there was stuff we didn't explicitly say that we're actually generic. Um, we don't really care. We just care that it's four parts. And that goes well, you can actually assign any meaning that you want to each segment. So let's just go down to the example where let's say in maybe a, a shop floor kind of setup that you have a gateway, but you want to use this kind of four part identifier to represent the location within the factory. So so that I know you can subscribe to um, all devices running in the same building or the same area or whatever. Um, so this is where manual registration messages come in because you can actually control the whole process as you want. So it's not required, but it it just able, uh, enables people to be more flexible with how they solve the IoT solutions, um, to being more kind of adaptable to the requirements of each individual project. So with the registration of the device, so normally if you would have a child device, it'd be something like, TE device belt 01, because that's the name of my child device, empty, empty, like just slash slash. But because I want to actually use all of this kind of um, uh, topic structure, 
for some local um, efficient subscriptions, I'm just going to register that a child device has some hierarchy based on location. So it still only makes sense if that's on the same gateway, um, but that's fine. So we can actually take this message. So just to confirm, I'm on the main device. So we only have child zero one at the moment. So let's just use the shell plugin. And so what I'm expecting from this is we're using a type at type child device, which tells thin edge, ah, you want a thin edge child device, gotcha. So we can create the right entity and then each mapper will then translate that to whatever cloud equivalent. We're giving it a custom name because we want to be in control with that a little bit more user uh, friendly, where we just say belt 001 instead of some kind of automatic thing. And we're just giving it a type because the type is also important that we register this message locally uh, so that we also have a rich um, description of the type of the device because that might be dependent how you communicate with the device. So you need to also know that. Uh, so let's just copy paste that and execute. OK, it's done. Now let's have a look. And we have belt 001 here. We can see that has type conveyor belts and the name is all taken as is. So all of this, or let, let's go back and publish. Oh yeah, using example again. So let's just copy paste. So I'm now publishing an event. So the identifier is exactly what we used up here. It's the same thing because we say, hey, I want to register that this topic means this device or this service or whatever. Then the channel part is E for events. Then we're giving it a type running status. So that's just an event type. So we can then filter maybe on device or have the information in Comvelocity or AWS Azure. Um, and we just say belt started. So let's just execute that. Let's go back to the child device, look at the events, and it's been mapped to the right device. So this whole setup then works also for custom things. Um, so you can also register services of child devices um, in whatever nested child devices and whatever. Uh, so if you go through just the registration um, information, then you should be able to uh, see how you register a parent and the relationship in between the two uh, things. And I'll answer a question just in a sec. Uh, so uh, what also is happening under the hood is we're doing automatic name prefixing so that when you do this device registration, because I didn't use an at ID, which says I want to be in control with the, uh, let's say external identity, which is used in the clouds to reference this device. I just want Thin Edge to worry about that for me because it has all the information it needs to kind of create a unique entry in the cloud uh, where it uses, you know, the main device um, certificate common name and then builds up basically the topic structure uh, in the external ID. So that means I can also register a child. I don't need to think about that this is running on what main device. When you're in the local context, it's assumed, well, you're publishing to the broker, which is listened to by the main device, like the thin edge main device, it will work out. And when communicating to you know the back end, it will go, ah, OK, well, to make sure we don't have name clashes, I'm just going to swap out TE with the common name of the certificate. So that was also new. Um, again, we presented that before and if you kind of, I think the last sprint demo or the previous one uh, to ease the the whole setup with using unique names, because that's very hard when you're on a child device, you don't know what is unique until it's created. Uh, so this guarantees uniqueness. So given that it's a lot of information, I'll, uh, Marco, you had a question. Yes, so I would like to know this, um, let's say hierarchy you created here, where is this stored? Is it somewhere centrally stored that everybody knows then this? Yes. Or... OK, so let's just have a look at that because that's a good question. Um, so I'll use the console I had opened before. I'm on the child device. Um, so. Uh, sorry.
So because, and that was part of the reasoning why we opted for the fixed four part uh, scheme. So it's also easier to observe and you don't have to do like four subscriptions for whatever layers and because MQT does not have a starts with prefix kind of setup. So if I just do this, I could actually see what entities have been registered on that broker for the entire broker. So I can see that the, the services on the main device, I can see that the child device has been registered, um, services on the child device, and here is also my custom thing. So you can also observe it and reason with, hey, what's happening on the device? Mm -hmm. cool. Also, which is a good kind of lead into um, another good point, so maybe oh, this is so as, as as soon as you subscribe to this topic, you get a message. Or yeah, because they're retained messages. Yes, it's retained yeah. and you get the, the latest one automatically, yeah. which is which is also great. And part of the the very strong discovery kind of mechanism that you can also see what out what else is out there locally on the broker to then make smarter decisions. Should I activate mm -hmm. this service or not? Um, is it worthwhile? And this goes, we've used the same concept. So not only for device registration, service registration, but also capability registration. So you might think, well, you have a child device. Does it support restarting? Mm. So you can actually subscribe to, so we have the four parts. So we don't, at this point, we don't really know what child device or main device, we don't really care. We just want to mm -hmm. say, well, what supports the restart command? Mm. Cool. I see that we have, so the main device and child device support restart command. So I know that I can actually send that. Um, we still, I think, need to formally, formally document the JSON structure for each individual command. We've listed the commands in the documentation, but I don't think we've put the uh, JSON um, schema or yeah, scheme in at the moment. Uh, but that will definitely come because that's part of our documentation push for V1 and part of it because we also want to enable people to run these commands locally, because sometimes it's really, really useful, or if you're just debugging and maybe you don't have a cloud interface, because it's disconnected from the network at the moment, you can still trigger this stuff locally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just this self-describing kind of thing is super, super powerful. Because um, you can just see what features are out there, or if you just want to see what all commands are out there, so you can see this is a common pattern that was part of making this generic. All of these things kind of fell out from it and part of the good API design that we spent, took the extra time to get that right, that you can kind of see very easily what all um, the things are supported. And obviously, so, if so you can be as specific as you want. If I just want the device child 01, you can then go, hey, what supported operations are there? Then you go, even the log file types, uh, those are the types I can request. But, but cool. this is this is all discovered on the fly, right? The yes. Services are starting up, publishing their current, um, let's say, um, commands, etc. And yeah. also, when I have registered this device um, with, with this string, um, and it's created inside of Cumulosity, and you start up Synage, and this device is not starting up for any reason, it's it's just not there. So there is no database or anything. No, no, it's it's using the retained messages from uh, Mosquito. So we do have some persistence, um, but I, that wouldn't be part of any public API. Um, but I think for any kind of um, viewpoint, uh, it relies on the Mosquito retained persistence. Um, so yes, that does is a good point that you should be enabling persistence on your MQT uh, on your Mosquito broker setup. Mm -hmm. um, I think in some operating systems that's default, but I would have to check that if that's uh, the default for everywhere. Um, but you can always just change the configuration very easily. You can even use the Nedge to do that. Um, it's not too tricky. Okay. Is there any ways we can push this um, hierarchy to Cumulosity? You know what I mean? I mean, this is a setup, a factory setup. Yeah, this sensor is in that room, et cetera, et cetera. It's some sort of a, a, a hierarchy that also could be used in asset 
uh, digital to win yeah, manager. Ah, right. gotcha. um, yeah, so if you uh, want that information, so you can actually also publish uh, inventory manage objects in commodity terminology or just you know properties on your digital twin mm -hmm. because we also support that in the uh, telemetry data type so exactly like events and alarms you can also mm -hmm. store whatever information you want so I um, could I could actually uh, retrieve all that information from this schema here from this topic structure correct. and put the cumulosity using a separate inventory service or something like yeah, that. Yeah, ex exactly. Or you, you know, you don't you don't actually have to stall. So I think in the example, I, I put all of this extra, which is you know not read by anything except for maybe a registration service that is like uh, sorry something listening to that that knows how to interpret that. But they're all kind of like just, just local information. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. To maybe contextualize it. So that but maybe is, you know this is actually transferred to Cumulosity here. Those, those no, metadata? not that part. Not that. But part. you okay. can do that because we we did that by on purpose because the registration message should be there to better describe how local components can interact with this device. Mm -hmm. So that's quite important because we have additional digital twin information that that is saying I want to push that to the cloud because we know how to map that. Um, so we've, because a lot of that information, so the registration is more a static kind of um, in nature. Um, so we decided to make a very strong decoupling from those two, that the digital twin is not meant to be static. So you can use it to represent location information, especially if location changes over time, that equipment moves around, uh, that you'd use the digital twin interface. Um, that's like, for example, again, pub, get rid of that, and twin, I know, subtype, example. If that was like location, or you can do complex, oops, I've forgotten quotes because it's meant to be a string. If I go back to... Child zero one, and I think I can use the nice new UI to add that property in. Subtype. Example. So it's you can do rich objects, arrays, whatever you want. Uh, so it follows the same type that that's the key, and then that's the value. Uh, so if you're giving it a literal string, you have to, it's expected JSON. So for JSON to be JSON, you need to quote it. Um, but I think most of the time uh, it will be a, an object most likely. It's usually, because you usually want to group the data somehow or whatever. Uh, but just looking at the time, I'll just follow up on the, the last remaining items. Um, so I'd really encourage you to read the documentation. Uh, regarding the API, because I think that's probably the the biggest kind of drastic um, change for everyone. Um, but at least it shouldn't break everything because we have the the mapping of the tedge forward slash commands to the T uh, topics. Um, the one great kind of change that we also announced last time, uh, but just to reiterate, we've restructured how the binaries are compiled and we've created a multi-core binary which means that our install size has reduced significantly. Um, so if you want all the bells and whistles of thin edge, it's gone down from 40 meg install size down to seven, eight meg. So that should make it easier also to install on devices and to download it because compressed, that would be like 3.5 meg. Um, so it's very easy, not a lot of bytes to download and to install, it doesn't take a lot of disk space. So multi-core binaries, it's a similar setup to what Alpine uses BusyBox for. Um, it might be just useful just for those who are curious. LH. So if I just look at the, so first of all, the, the Tedge command, so we can see that has increased in size. But if you look at the agent, 
14 bytes because it is just a symlink. So all of the other binaries are just symlinks to Tej. Um, and the Tej is smart enough to go, ah, that's meant to be the Tej agent. I'm going to run as a Tej agent. So the functionality hasn't changed whatsoever, but it's meant we've been able to reduce the installation footprint significantly. Um, and this is the precursor to the consolidation of the services that we will reduce uh, the amount of binaries that we have. So I'm just going to then conclude with um, a few kind of, I would say, deprecation notices um, and a bit of a warnings uh, that uh, we've noticed recently with Mosquito. Um, so deprecation notices, please start using the TE topics um, because I think the, the benefits that they deliver outweigh not moving. Um, we're still undecided whether we will, we, we might turn off the automatic translation for the Tej commands to TE um, by feature flag. I think it's quite likely we'll have it in the product still to smoothen the transition because we don't want to put a blocker why people um, to not upgrade to the latest and greatest. Um, but I think it's good to be able to enjoy the benefits of all of the other kind of plugin infrastructure. Um, so all of the, the new commands, all of the plugins that also we maintain as a community, we will be switching to the new TE topics. So it would make the transition easier if you also start doing that for your own components. Um, and also with child device registration, I would really encourage to use the new explicit MQZ topics because you get a lot of benefits from that, that you can control what type it is and that from the get go. Um, and you're a little bit more explicit and making yourself more discoverable. And you can also use nested child devices and you know nested to the nth degree if you really want. Um, so you can really make the use of this new kind of functionality, which we don't support using the older style file creation or folder creation, I believe, um, on the Tedge file system use the MQT because we will be turning off the um, child device creation via local folder file creation um, because it wasn't a very good interface um, and or it just had a lot of downsides that you always need access to the file system, which isn't always the case. Um, so with new MQT interface, you can do this from anywhere. So it supports Docker or like in container story very well. Um, so I would really start getting familiar with that. Then one of the one of the warnings. Uh, so just one sec. Just muting. Uh, so one of the warnings. So we've detected uh, we have a recommended or recommendation that people try to use the Mosquito Broker two zero eighteen um, as soon as possible because there's a few bugs in older versions, which cause a few issues with some configuration, which is mandatory to use, um, mostly regarding the bridge settings. So whether you can lose a few outgoing bridge, uh, sorry, messages that go through the bridge um, because of mosquito bugs. So I've listed the, the links to the GitHub issues, where basically most of the comments are they're solved in, you know, a future version, but then the future version also has its own problems with other um, regression bugs. So I would encourage you to use 2018, but we're also looking to see if we can make it easier to install the latest and greatest um, Mosquito version, potentially hosting it in CloudSmith where we host all of our packages now, um, but we're still looking at how to make that possible. Um, but we're also going to be talking with Mosquito um, uh, maintainers uh, to discuss kind of any kind of how we can improve that situation. Um, so we're also on it and in contact with the actual uh, maintainers of the of Mosquito project as well. Um, so please bear with us. It was a bit of a unfortunate find um, for us. So I think in normal operation, um, Generally, it's fine. It's just when if you have connectivity breaks that and then the service restarts that in some kind of corner cases, you could potentially drop messages, which is not in itself catastrophic. 
but it is annoying um, and it can be just unexpected. Um, so we'll create an issue and link these things so people can reference them. Um, and then we'll look to add that in the documentation notes, but it's only a few days old that we've discovered this. Um, so final remarks. So end of year, as I said before, the push is to get V1 out. So firmware, uh, we're pushing to get that included to have a like a software management plugin interface, but for firmware um, and also the consolidation of the services. Um, so as also previously mentioned, moving from the current scenario where we have our five into two, where the TEDG agent is then responsible for everything, and the mapper is really just doing the cloud connection translation uh, layer. The device profile stuff has been pushed back to next year, but I think that will be a short coming up after the firmware um, next year. But uh, it has been postponed from to 2024, like early 2024. Well, given the time, I'm happy to stay longer if someone has questions. Um, I know I'm also 12 minutes over, um, so I'm happy to stay if someone's interested. Um, if not, thanks for joining and we'll see you next time.